Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Oxford Metrics PLC Preliminary Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review your questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and if you give that the kind, your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to CEO Imogen Morehouse. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, and with me is David, our CFO, who I'm sure you know well. Uh, but as you probably don't know me, some of you may, uh, I thought we'd just give a small, short background of my history with Oxford Metrics. Uh, I joined Vicon Motion Systems in uh, January of 2001, three months before the IPO and worked in technical sales, predominantly in the life sciences market, uh, traveling extensively in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Korea, Australia, New Zealand for a number of years, and then moved through various roles, working with Nick Bolton, the previous uh, CEO for 18 years, uh, encapsulating production manager, ops manager, managing director, COO, and then uh, in 2012, operational CEO of Vicom. So I just want to reassure everyone that the five-year plan that was announced in October of 2021 was heavily involved in uh, agreeing those uh, strategies with Nick and David, and equally uh, in the background involved in some of the M&A activity that we'll be covering today. So um, that's a potted history of my background and then moving into the joint PLC Vicon role as of the 1st of October this year. So in the presentation today, we'll be covering, David will cover the financial highlights of our, our year and then back to me to cover some of the progress we've made on our strategic plan, uh, the opportunities that we see for the growth and executing on the five year plan and then some, something on, on the outlook for the 24 year and then opening it up for Q&A. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David to take you through the financial highlights. David. Uh, thank you, Imogen. I would also like to add uh, my welcome to this uh, this morning's session. Uh, yeah. Firstly, the headlines moving from top left to right. Overall revenues were up 53.5% year on year at 44.2 million. FX underlying growth was near 52.4%, so back to similar. As stated in the preliminary statement, adjusted for the 3.5 million of orders carried over from FY22, the underlying growth year on year was around 26%. We are also reporting an order book of 11.5 million compared with 24 million last year, which reflects a normalization of customer purchasing behavior. A headline profit after tax for continual operations is reported at 5.7 million compared with a profit of 3.4 million a year ago. Moving to the second row on an adjusted PBT basis, which excludes non-cash related items and exceptional costs, a profit of 6.5 million is reported compared with 2.6 million last year. A little later, I will explain the bridge between the two years in some more detail and include some insight into the first half, second half split. This all translated into an adjusted EPS of 4.57 pence per share compared with 2.55 pence a year ago. The headline cash position as of the 30th of September 2023 was 64.8 million, so slightly down due to the deployment of cash for inventory purposes and the payment of the final dividend of 3.25 million. Unsurprisingly, investors often ask why we, what we plan to do with it. Well, the short answer is we intend to deploy in M&A. To explain, it's worth rewinding a year or so. The cash is there as a, as a result of the yachted disposal. And following this, we went fishing, so to speak, in our own pond, looking for opportunities in our immediate space. Whilst there may be opportunity here, it soon became apparent that we need to look elsewhere since the number of opportunities were limited. Imogen suggested we consider engineering, where our core technology, in other words, vision science, was being used in adjacent markets, which led us to explore businesses involved in smart manufacturing. In doing so, we identified IVS along with many other potential opportunities. The acquisition of IVS was concluded last month, which is immediately earnings enhancing. Extending the fishing analogy a little further, uh, we are no longer fishing in a pond. We are now 
fishing in an ocean where there are many more opportunities. And so the MA pipeline today features smart manufacturing with the intention of building out our presence in this marketplace. Given the potential MA opportunities we currently have, the cash will remain on the balance sheet. That said, the board are and will continue to keep this under review. So if at some point in the future we feel that MA opportunities that does not warrant retaining the cash, the board will at that point make the call in terms of returning cash to shareholders. So for now, the cash will stay where it is. Moving to the third row, and I think I may have just dropped out. Just, just it's just your camera, David. Do carry on and we'll bring you back up in a moment. Okay. So moving to the third row, a final dividend of 2.75 pence per share is, is proposed, representing a 10% increase over last year. Vicon has invested 2.1 million in new IP during the year, representing around 30% of total R&D expenditure. Capitalized expenditure was down from 2.8 million last year, uh, which included the high-end Valkyrie camera. The inventory position at 7.2 million was up from 4.5 million last year. Given the supply chain challenges over the past few years, inventory of components have around our ability to deliver on the order book. And in doing so, also provides us with a hedge against any other unforeseen disruption. Going forward, the business is now bigger, so inventory is likely to be higher than it was in the past. But we will be endeavouring to reduce inventory during the course of the next financial year to a more optimal level. I will now take a look at the FY23 trading performance in some detail, starting with revenues, which I'll look at in three ways. Firstly, historic. The record revenues reported clearly stand out, but arguably the presentation should perhaps be smooth given the three and a half million of orders carried over into FY23. That said, the overall trajectory is clear. Over the past 10 years, what you see here with 22-23 smoothed out is equivalent to a 9% CAGR, driven by the wider adoption of our technology across all markets and the introduction of a broader range of camera solutions. This is what we believe is, is the background growth before getting into the exciting opportunities that lay ahead. Did you want me to reactivate my camera this end, Investor Me? Uh, you, you can, David, but we'll have to just momentarily lose you. If you're happy, I'll refresh your browser now. Yeah. Thank you. Just give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to bring David uh, back in, and then the camera will be uh, visible. If you just press allow there, David, we should be able to bring up both your microphone and your camera. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Continue to work. Oh. Right here. Right. Well, you can see my office at home now. Anyway, we'll carry on. So looking at revenues the second way geographically. Uh, so the first thing to say is that we saw growth across all our geographic main markets and the mix changed slightly given particularly strong growth in North America and in Asia Pacific. In general terms, the US benefited from the largest deal in engineering, uh, which we alluded to at the last interim, so grew by 61%. And Asia Pacific continued to benefit from buoyant entertainment market reporting a 74.8% improvement year on year. The third take on revenue, revenue analysis is by market segment. So on the left is the reported performance and on the right, the order book. The engineering segment was up 56%, driven in part by the part shipment of the large order I just mentioned. And other notable deals included ITESM, a Monterey based university who purchased a Valkyrie system for drone tracking. Another university in Arizona purchased a Valkyrie system to track crazy fly drones and Manitoba purchased a large Valkyrie system to track UAVs in the air and robots on the ground as they developed solutions for the agricultural marketplace. In entertainment, reported revenues were up 82%. The market remains buoyant and accounts for nearly half of revenues and the order book. Not notable deals this year included Cover Japan, who installed four motion capture stages to allow VTubers to capture content for their channels, a trend we mentioned this time last year. And Double Negative's partnership with Dimension Studio continued with the purchase of a virtual production stage uh, for the use uh, for content creation. 
Life, life sciences revenues were up 40% year on year, including a strong showing in the second half. Notable deals here included the hospital Israelita Albert Einstein, bit of a mouthful that one, now the largest gate lab in Brazil. The University of Padova in Italy installed a new system for high speed analysis with the Italian Paralympic team. And elsewhere in Australia, Victoria University continued to provide gold standard testing for all of FIFA's research using Valkyrie 16 and 26 systems. And in the US, the University of Rochester Medical Center installed multiple Valkyrie laboratories for spine and other biomedical research. Location-based entertainment reported revenues of 2.5 million, so 5% down compared to last year. But this is not reflective of the underlying potential. As we have said before, this market has great promise, but the reality is our revenue growth is reliant on the pace of customer rollout and ultimately the consumer acceptance of this exciting technology. And there is evidence this is happening. You can see for yourself by visiting sandboxvr.com. They recently announced their 45th center and at immersivegamebox.com, you can see they have 30 more, all enabled by Vicon technology. Furthermore, Immersive also announced in October exciting news of their multi-million pound and multi-territory collaboration agreement with Merlin Entertainment. Their press release states there is a huge potential for a significant rollout across the Merlin estate over the coming years, starting with Sydney and Oberhausen in Germany by the end of this year. Each site hosts eight freestanding game boxes, so the opportunity for us of this collaboration is significant over the coming years. So continue to watch this space. Finally, turning to the order book, uh, the order intake this year was 31.7 million, which compared with 46.9 million in FY22. Post-pandemic customer buying behavior changed, which definitely saw customers placing orders in advance to get in the queue. So it is fair to at least average the order intake over the past two years and arguably weight it slightly in favor of this year. Accepting this as a reasonable approximation of underlying order intake, the rate of order intake sits well with future expectations. 11.5 million now represents a more acceptable level for our customers in terms of lead time, and we will be seeking to maintain the order book at around this level in broad terms going forward. Together with the current sales pipeline opportunities, the business has visibility on well over half of next year's revenue expectations, a strong position that was previously unheard of uh, prior to the pandemic. So turning to adjusted PBT, the following bridge provides the opportunity to discuss how we achieve the six and a half million. So on the left is the 2.6 million from last year. And as we move to the right, the first item is FX. As it turned out, the overall impact of, of this year on year was negligible, so I will move on. We generated a great deal more gross margin in absolute terms by dint of more revenues, but we have seen some gross margin erosion due to, <laughs> due to uh, some <laughs> pressure. Year on year, this reduced gross margin by around two and a half points, equating to around 1.1 million of gross margin. As we've indicated in the preliminary statement, the supply chain situation has normalized, which means that inventory is gradually being replaced at a lower cost. And together with an increase in list prices on certain products, we expect next year's gross margin to be restored to near historic normals. From a cost based perspective, there was an increase of around 6 million, which was due to a variety of reasons. Firstly, the 2.8 million investment previously announced, which was included in the five year plan, is now fully baked in. Much of this was R&D and has been expensed in PL this year, which relates to the research phase of the marvelous technology, which we can now finally talk about, having unveiled it publicly this year. And there will be a lot more on Markless from Imogen in a few moments. The business more generally has grown and there's been operational ads during the year to strengthen the business. And there has been some cost of living related increases, which included sal a salary review uh, favoring lower paid employees in the business. And finally, given the overall performance this year, this did give rise to an increase in variable incentives, meaning commissions and bonuses. 
And the overall apparent increase was a little second half weighted. However, adjusting for costs incurred in the second half that are in effect related to the full year, the split of profitability between the two halves is in fact relatively even. So continuing to the right, R&D capitalization was 0.7 million lower and amortization was 0.6 million higher, all largely due to Valkyrie amortization following a high year of capitalization last year. And the final piece of the reconciliation is interest received, which adds 1.6 million to complete the bridge uh, to the reported adjusted PBT of six and a half million. So in summary, from me, a record revenue performance of 44.2 million delivered an adjusted profit of 6.5 million. And we have an order book of an 11 and a half, which coupled with current sales pipeline means we already have visibility on over half of next year's expected revenues. In light of this performance, the board are recommending a final dividend of 2.75 pence per share. And the strong balance sheet underpinned by the 64.8 million in cash means the business is in good shape and well prepared for exciting times ahead. Back to you. Thank you, David. OK, so um, let's move to the strategic pro progress area of the presentation. Uh, firstly, just to recap of the company uh, that delivered that 44.2 million and what Vicon actually does. Um, so the, the five-year plan announced in October 2021 is to return two and a half times revenue um, with an adjusted profit for tax of 15% margin with an organic and inorganic investment. Um, so at the time that the, the uh, plan was announced, Yotta was still within the group. Vicon's contribution uh, to that was the investment that um, was sought by myself to uh, develop the marketless technology um, the 2.8 million. Um, so that was my sort of contribution to that as the Vicon, Vicon organic play, but also identifying um, companies in the pond that David's talked about that we may wish to, um, to look at in terms of competitors, technical partners, third party uh, item manufacturers and so forth. So just to restate, that is where we would like to uh, exit 2026 and there'll be a little bit more granularity in this presentation as to how we intend to do this. So firstly Vicon, a 39 year old uh, business, play the, could you please play the video? Um, Vicon is in 3D motion capture of humans, animals and objects. Uh, we own all our IP, it's all in-house developed including the cameras, embedded software, software and analysis of that software. We serve four main markets in order of history. Life sciences was the bedrock market for the business. In the mid 90s, the visual effects industry started to adopt motion capture in terms of CG, computer graphics. Then in the early 2000s, the engineering market came along where in a lot of cases, the markers are being attached to objects, not to people. And then finally, the uh, location-based entertainment market which started to emerge in 2017, 2018. Next slide, please. Ooh. So could you, if we could play the video here, this is just a snapshot of some of the customers that use Vicon technology. This is the LeBron James Center in, uh, at, in at Nike in the United States. At the time, our largest life sciences deal we'd ever done as a business in 2019. The entire center is outfitted with Vicon Tech for athlete rehab and performance, sports shoe and apparel design and testing. Moving to a pandemic grown industry in visual effects, which was in-camera visual effects for virtual production. Nobody could travel, so you needed to bring the set to the lot. But in order to make the, the production, you need to be able to track the Hero broadcast camera and bring all of this technology together. So the Vicon Tech is looking at the crown sitting on top of that camera. In games, AAA games, Vicon enjoys the top 20 companies in the world as customers. This is Ubisoft in Canada shooting for Assassin's Creed. Lots of people in dark suits wearing markers running around in front of cameras. This is NASA the Ingenuity helicopter design and test with the Mars rover as well. Again, you can see here markers attached to objects, not to people. 
So this is being used to turn an, uh, an object from to become autonomous, where you need to train the control systems so it become un untethered as it is in this design phase to the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. And location-based entertainment. This is the game box that if you were at the Capital Markets Day in October of 2021, you would have been in these game boxes having fun with, with your colleagues and friends. So that's the th four main markets for Vicon. Next slide, please. And here's a snapshot of some of the customers we can talk to you about from the Vicon perspective. Um, but moving on to the more exciting um, growth perspectives for Vicon. Uh, David explained there's um, a natural uh, growth uh, uh, market-based uh, tech, and that's around 9%. But in order for Vicon to have to address the organic growth play of Oxford Metrics 2021 to 26 strategy, we needed to break out of that CAGA. So this is the investment in the Markless technology and why this is exciting. So Markless technology and Markless tracking is emerging as an adjacent tracker to marker based. It is not competitive in terms of the way that we feel it is. An, it is another tracking modality that is an add to marker based. Markless tracking is at its beginnings. It's in its beginnings. Its precision and accuracy are nowhere near that of marker based. But in certain markets and in certain use cases, markerless is in a good enough state to be used. So what you see here is the CTO of Vicon, Mark Finch, being tracked without any special black suit or wearing any markers at all on a show floor in August of 2023 at SIGGRAPH, which is a computer graphic show in Los Angeles. And behind him is his Ken doll avatar, which you know we just happened to have at the same time as the movie came out. And he's talking the audience through the markerless technology and how it works. And we spent a long time working on this technology in terms of R&D. We started actually four years ago with a very small seed team prior to the larger investment from Oxford Metrics. And the reason we needed that investment is the people and the brains that make this type of technology are not the same disciplines as those that make marker based. This is a machine learning problem, an AI problem to solve, and it's a different discipline. So we've had to hire an entire uh, team to come in to, to accelerate the development of this. The way to think about the machine learning aspects of this is this is a system that needs to be trained to understand what it's looking at. In a marker based system, you simply put the markers on, tell the system that the marker is on the left shoulder and it knows that's the left shoulder. But how does this system know where Mark's left shoulder is if there's no marker? Well, it needs to understand I'm looking at a human being stood up, moving their arms about. So you train it. The way to think about this training. Most people now are quite familiar with chat GPT and large language models, which uses the Internet and text to train itself. What we are building at Vicon is a large vision model. So we're ingesting data, both real and synthetic data. But this is data of movement, of vision, so that we can grow and, and train our system to understand more movements types of movements, but also to improve the accuracy of the underlying modeling and solving of this. But this is a proprietary model. This is not an open source model as LLMs tend to be. So we are, we are building that and that requires us to work very, very closely with our customers uh, as well as our R&D team. The way that we will um, gain this data and gain and move forward with this is via a cloud infrastructure. This, will, this system is a training system, so it needs to learn, get better, and push the improvements back out to our customer base. And that will be done by the cloud. As soon as there's um, a cloud uh, infrastructure in place, then we have the opportunity to discuss alternate commercial models with our client base. Vicon to this point is a very CapEx related uh, market but we feel that there is a, a play in certain markets and certain use cases for an OPEX subscription style model of the software elements of this solution to improve 
the revenue visibility and quality of Oxford metric software. We're very excited about this. And behind Mark was a location-based entertainment uh, experience with that we um, implemented with our partner Dreamscape Immersive. What we wanted to test here was, does our marketless technology, is it good enough for the LBE experience? And the reason we, that Dreamscape wanted to move to Markless is during the pandemic, the economic model of the previous tech stack they were using, which involved markers, uh, proved not to be scalable on the, the size and scale that they wished to do. So we actually worked with Dreamscape um, quite a lot during uh, COVID to develop this uh, solution for the, specifically for their LBE experience. So when we went to the show, we had two tests. Mark walking around being tracked as a 3D avatar, perhaps in a visual effects environment. And then behind him, the Dreamscape pod, putting six people through at a time in their normal clothes, just wearing a headset and enjoying the clockwork forest uh, experience. And I'm pleased to say that in all cases, our, we, we exceeded our expectation on our KPIs, putting over 250 people through the experience without with only one person who didn't calibrate because they were wearing some interesting clothes. So what we did was we just picked the skirt up a bit so that our calibration could see the feet and off we went. It was all fine. She was wearing a hoodie and a skirt down to the floor, which we hadn't considered was a fashion statement and hadn't trained our solution to be able to see that. So it didn't see it until we showed the feet. So all good there. We've got the opportunity here with the Markless based to sell to our existing client base. We have 10,000 customers and we know very well that in a lot of cases they will, they will buy the technique and add it to their market-based solution. So we have the sales, marketing and distribution power to go after uh, that, that customer base very, very simply. And because we, um, we, we got such a strong positive market reaction and technically um, everything worked very well at SIGGRAPH, we have now a fairly aggressive timeline to commercialize Markless within fiscal year 24 with some modest revenue expectations, but as a real growth driver for fiscal year 25. So now I would like uh, the people that went through the Dreamscape experience to tell you what they thought. These are industry professional mocap people. They understand good tracking, not consumer levels. So what we did was we filmed quite a few people coming out of the Dreamscape um, experience and ask them uh, what they thought. So if you could play the next video with sound, then these guys can hear that. One of the things that we have to go through doing motion capture is we have to take all the time to put on I, like the, all the marker suits and it, it, it's, it's a long process so I think both from the experience aspect and from the technical aspect this is very promising and I look forward to whatever development Vicon is going to bring to us. The experience was great. I was really impressed to see six people all in the um, stage all at the same time especially using markerless. We have a Vicon system at my studio and we've been hearing a lot of rumors about Vicon developing their own markerless system and it was awesome to get really one of the first chances to see it and test it myself. I think the um, they did a great job in the narrative of trying to utilize such a small space to feel, make you feel like you have gone a great distance. Um, utilizing the trick of shrinking you and making the place feel more expansive, I think was a great use of the space. It was a really cool experience. Like it, it, it feels like this is where like experiences are headed. I've been coming to SIGGRAPH on and off since 1996. Uh, I was here almost every single SIGGRAPH in 2000s. And this is the best thing I've ever seen at SIGGRAPH. Hands down, ever. <laughs> it's an incredible experience. Okay, next slide, please. Great, thanks. So now I'd like to turn to um, our recent acquisition, Industrial Vision Systems. Um, as David explained, we um, were looking within the Vicon uh, area, but unfortunately there was nothing uh, in that area that was um, of, of ultimately we, we could get over the line or, or past our, uh, our metrics in terms of acquisition. So 
looking at IVS, this is in the smart manufacturing. IVS use cameras, they use embedded software and software to solve a different vision problem to Vicon. That's the way to think about it in a kind of an adjacent market in engineering and smart manufacturing. The way to think about um, the previous uh, customer slide of Vicons with IVS is if we had a mutual customer, the Vicon system would be in the R&D lab and the IVS systems would be out on the shop floor on the production lines. So what IVS do is they use smart vision, uh, machine learning, and deep learning to um, inspect parts uh, that are being manufactured. Um, and they do that in markets that are highly regulated, that require high levels of compliance, such as pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices, contact lens inspection, automotive, and so forth. The picture that you see there is a, a syringe inspection system. The arm pulls the, the, the syringes into the drum, which spins, and the red cameras that you can see are the IVS cameras, which are taking and inspecting those syringes for manufacturing defo defects, flaws, cracks, uh, debris and dirt. Because obviously in these sort of environments, you must have a 100 percent right first time. Those sort of uh, fault parts cannot leave the factory. And you can see some of the marquee names of customers that they have uh, in the in that slide, too. I'd like to highlight in in. Johnson & Johnson, particularly in contact lens inspection. Um, contact lens is a, a very, very large market indeed. And um, in fact, Johnson & Johnson's largest market is in Japan. Um, the latest IVS machine is going to be shipped out to, to Japan. And uh, it's used for cosmetic lens inspection, not for uh, prescription, uh, because of the changing the color of the eyes for cosmetic reasons, um, which is kind of interesting. Next slide, please, and the video would be great. So I always like to show, not tell. This is an automotive inspection cell um, using IVS technology, but this is a dimensional tolerancing question and manufacturing defects. So the two IVS cameras you can see are on the robot arms. They're inspecting the device or the, the, the part, and they're taking multiple images and comparing those images against the CAD, the computer-aided design, library photo shots, and other uh, devices to other data sources to ensure that this part is compliant. I want to go back to the, 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 the markets that they're kind of serving in terms of their size at this point, as well as this video plays through. Contact lens market was valued at 14.6 billion in 2021. It has a CAGR of 5.5%. Uh, medical devices, syringes, 1.33 billion with a CAGR of 8.8%. .8%. Um, paracetamol and packaging of 9.8 billion market. And then total knee replacement parts. If you recall the previous slide, there was a striker uh, was on there, a very large orthopedic company. IVS make a dimension tolerancing uh, inspection system for them for parts used in total knee replacement, which is one of the largest growing operations worldwide with over a million being conducted in the United States alone. Next slide, please. OK, so IVS are um, conducting themselves in some very, very, very large market sizes compared to perhaps motion capture. And we we know very well that by further in, uh, execution um, commercially of them rather than their products, which are excellent, we can uh, we can grow them very successfully. Next slide, please. We uh, we do uh, we do have the video uploaded if you wish to play that. It's, uh, okay, yeah, great. Let's have the video. Thank I can you. then uh, give you a little bit of the technology Perfect. play on this one as well. So this is a little bit of a, a technology of the future for IVS. The, the this is a, the Advanced Manufacturing Center, and it's a factories of the future a concept of a technician working collaboratively with a robot, which is quite topical. But equally, this guy is wearing a pair of HoloLens glasses, which are instructing him of what to do. Pick, place, assemble, where to put the part, where to, to uh, put it onto the bench. And then the bench is also checking he's done it correctly. So it's a complete closed loop. And he's working with a, a robot here. And this robot, um, you know, he has to be safe working with that robot. So it's very important. That, that he is, and I can imagine a Vicon Markler system 
uh, around this bench uh, making sure that the, uh, the robot arm and the human arm never come into conflict uh, because we know who would win in that situation this is a real you know lower lowering the bar to entry for technician training uh, factors of the future smart workbench concept which uh, we we think is a, a very exciting potential growth area for for the part in smart manufacturing. Okay, great. Thanks. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll take back over. So this is really how we we intend to execute on the twenty six plan. We will hunt and farm better in our marker based tech stack. That's the Vicon business as you know it today by focusing on sales, marketing, and product activities. Um, we are taking as many of the principles, modern principles of SaaS businesses, such as customer success, sales enablement, lead gen, lead nurturing, and applying those to Vicon. As if we consider the, the, the SAM system or solution addressable market for Vicon is probably 120 to 150 million. We've still got a lot to go in, in terms of growing that from the 44 that we enjoyed in the previous year. We want to commercialize the marketless opportunities. You can see we can sell if we sell that to most of our existing customers. We can reinvigorate the Dreamscape partnership and others with the marketless tech stack. Um, and then equally over, over time, talk to use cases where markers could never have been worn, which has always been a, a barrier in certain in certain market conditions. And then getting slightly further down the line as the software becomes more mature possibility of detaching the software from the Vicon hardware and deploying it into existing video infrastructures, perhaps in shopping malls, airports, hospitals, care homes, etc. Then we will execute on the smart manufacturing. It makes sense. We've bought IVS to build, build in and around that. And there are more companies out there that we're having active conversations with in that space and equally develop them by um, commercial focus um, for them, they've been slightly less commercially focused in the past, but with Oxford Metrics to support them, uh, we will develop their sales sales activities as a matter of urgency. And then in Power Up, that's a kind of slightly, we'll consider other things that help accelerate the other three. It's not a disparate uh, strategy play. It needs to make sense in terms of synergies. It needs to pull in, but perhaps an acquisition that maybe doesn't currently meet our current metrics and David and I would have a long conversation about that but if there was a path to profitability but it was something you know that we, we felt it was the right thing to do then we would consider it so what I'm really saying there is we're open to other opportunities and we'll talk about some of the potential targets in that in a couple of slides time but we must grow this group in a synergistic way we mustn't overload it with costs where we don't need to we need to grow and execute and scale sensibly keeping a firm eye on that profit line. So the smart manufacturing, we want to keep this sense, analyze, apply um, philosophy behind what we're looking at. But on the right hand side and the, the clearly stated metrics we've always said about our acquisitions, well, power up aside, uh, earnings accretive, IVS tick that box, the able management teams who you know they are staying with the business they want to see it grow and scale they're excited about being part of that story we must be able to buy at a fair price and scale using technical commercial synergies and then the power up some ideas on the right hand side you know the collaborative robots and vr in industry four vrs in vicon land there's no reason why it can't be in smart manufacturing there's other measurement techniques out there laser x-ray haptics and so forth that we will continue to consider that all come with related analysis softwares and obviously those that have perhaps an AR element will be equally attractive. GPU compression is a markerless play in its entirety about handling video sensibly and efficiently and both businesses have deep learning and AI in their solutions so we will continue to keep an eye on uh, companies and products in that space both from an opportunity and threat perspective excuse me so we entered 2021 this is with the yotta number backed out of it with 27 and a half million coming from the vicon motion capture industry we were exit 26 building that up to around 52 million building a markless arm to the business of around eight and we'll see 
what mix of revenue that we can apply to that as we get further down the commercial negotiations on that and building smart manufacturing arm of around 10 million. If we consider IVS is about three and a half million turnover, then uh, some more acquisitions and growth in that play means that that should be entirely uh, doable. So um, that's the conclusion, the main part of the um, presentation. In terms of outlook, just to reiterate some things that, that David said, we have very good visibility of over half the revenues that we need to execute on in fiscal year 24. We begin the commercialization of Markless, working first of all with Dreamscape Immersive on a beta program, followed by Vigil FX customers very close behind. We'll continue to seek the right acquisitions for the right reasons at the right price. And we are well capitalized to uh, work on this smart sensing opportunity, which is the Oxford Metrics Group philosophy. So thank you very much for your attention. That concludes the presentation um, and we will take any questions now. Uh, that's great. Imogen, David, thank you once again for updating investors. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. But just while Imogen and David take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd just like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the Q&A and the published recording will be available via your InvestorMeet company uh, dashboard. Um, Imogen, David, as you can see, you've had a number of questions from investors uh, during today's presentation, as well as a few that were pre-submitted that I think you've touched upon uh, during your presentation. If I may just hand back to you just to read out those questions and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Sure. Um, I think there's a, a fair a fair number of questions or comments in and around how we assess uh, m and David. So do you want to cover that off? Yeah, I was just going to cover off, shall I just cover off some of the pre-submitted questions very, very Yeah, quickly. yeah, sure. Um, so somewhere out there, somebody out there actually made a comparison of Vicon today with Vicon back in uh, 2019, uh, commenting why the operating margin had fallen. Um, mm years and what the forecast going forward well i think um the answer is really very simple this year um firstly the investment in the five-year plan which is 2.8 million is fully baked into this year's profit and loss account uh, which wasn't there four years ago um, we have seen gross margin erosion i've spoken about that in relation to uh, this year but it's also relevant compared to 19 um, when actually we had a gross margin of uh, 74 percent in that year which i think is probably the number in terms of outlook um, as we've said the gross margin next year you know combination of improved cost of, uh, cost of goods and uh, this price increases and in terms of you know the, the outlook going forward well we are we are building out a dedicated uh, markless facility in oxford this year but other than that, uh, there are no other major changes uh, to the cost base um, anticipated in the year ahead. Uh, someone also commented why uh, net cash had fallen. I think I've covered that. We we increased inventory, um, you know, to protect ourselves against supply chain disruption and so forth. We obviously paid a dividend, and uh, the reader of the accounts will probably also notice AR was a little higher, but that was really purely down to, you know, the trading pattern uh, that we saw during the course of the year. But overall, you know, the cash did generate business at an operating level. And then moving on really into the sort of M&A area, um, somebody asked, could you give us an update on M&A activity and our valuations coming down? I think the first point I kind of covered in terms of, you know, where we're now looking for our acquisition opportunities and in relation to valuations uh, yes there is evidence that they are coming down to more sensible uh, levels um, historically we do try and tend to avoid auction situations especially where private equity might be in the mix so a few years ago we simply couldn't compete with their very very deep pockets um, but where we're looking now we believe we are actually probably under the radar uh, to a large extent you know, we tend to approach uh, private owner founder businesses. We, you know, we seek to establish a relationship with the vendors uh, that leads to a period of exclusivity. And in fact, IVS um, is a perfect example uh, of that, uh, that led to the acquisition at an attractive uh, multiple. There are some other questions, some other questions. Uh, m and related in the list. Uh, let's see. 
criteria. Yeah, the, the criteria. Yeah. Christopher T asked, what key criteria do you look for when looking at M&A? Well, the new focus is very much smart manufacturing. So we're obviously looking for a technical uh, read across so that in time there will be um, you know, technological synergies and so forth. Um, I think for me, you know, the golden rule, you know, the deals need to be, uh, you know, price earnings enhancing. Um, and if they're not, we would have to be convinced that that was going to happen very, very soon um, afterwards. Um, what else we got? Do you want to do a few questions in my whilst I review the other questions? Yeah, sure. There's a little bit in and around competitors and um, IVS and things like that. Well, just they asked them that question and they kind of said, well, when we get spec'd in, none. So it's very much a technical spec play. They get spec'd in by J&J &J or whoever it is. And then once they're in, that's, that's it. They tend to be the incumbent technology or they seek to um, replace existing. There's so many companies in this space globally and they do, at the present time, focus very much on the UK and Ireland geographical markets. Um, some of their comp competitors are similar size. Some of their competitors are billion dollar corporations, famous names. But uh, they don't have the same solutions as, as IBS does. And in the Markler space, well, there's lots of emerging uh, products, possibly is a loose enough term, uh, technologies in Markler's some addressing quite a lot of them addressing consumer b2c uh animate people who are making uh content for their their own channels very simplistic animations um less so in the top end animation animators are very very um keen about the quality of the work that they produce it's very very important so at the area where we're currently dealing we don't currently see much competition so um, the the prioritization of, of getting our solution out there is is clear um but that we keep an eye on, on all activity in that space um so how will ai and ml affect toxic metrics business well it's going to grow it because we've got it in in all, all our solutions uh, but we do keep a very clear eye on uh, opportunity and threat in that space as well um Question around fair price and smart manufacturing space in terms of multiples, David. Yeah, I'm just looking at that one. So um, I, I suppose I know the whole rule is obviously we seek to acquire at multiples, you know, uh, lower than our own. Um, in, in the case of uh, IBS, for example, the multiple there was um, around 10, I think, of adjusted PBT. So that's, that's what a fair price looks like. And if it's, it's obviously lower than our own, that's great. That's great. Other question somebody asked: Would we use debt for M and A purposes? Well, uh, yes, we are. But, uh, but, uh, given the cash balance, the cash balance uh, quite a way off. And somebody also asked: Why was the interest received so tiny? Um, well, I would argue that 1.6 million isn't tiny, but the, um, the yeah. very rightly or wrongly, uh, over the past year or so, you would say when. Uh, when, when tranches of cash came up uh, for deposit, um, I normally opt for the best rate I could get for the longest period, whilst being mindful of actually when we might need, um, you know, the cash. So on a pure percentage basis, what we're earning at the moment is lagging what you might expect. But then, of course, if interest rates begin to decline in the future, we'll be ahead of the game in terms of interest that we're that we're earning. There is still cash required in the business environment for capital purposes. Um, so close that. Answered. There's a question here Emma, from Stephen R about can you give us target hopes for revenues in the current year? Um, I think you've covered that because we, we 
you know, obviously our analysts and there is uh, there is a research note available at oxfordmetrics.com uh, to give you a bit of a steer um, but ultimately our focus is on achieving the 70 million and 15 percent return uh, by the end of the five-year plan um, but if you want to be, if you want a little bit more information have a look at the uh, the note that is available on the website <laughs> yeah, someone, George O, has asked about uh, a target inventory days, any kind of ballpark figure um, that might be available. I think um, slightly diff slightly awkward to answer because even not just today, but always, you know, there are certain critical components in the camera uh, at the center, for example, which we have to carry strategically. Um, so that is always going to present you know, it's always going to mean the inventory is going to be, be a bit on the higher side. But I'm just doing, a, literally, I'm doing a live uh, calculation here. So, yeah, our stock turn at the moment then is around four times. So let's just say we're seeking to run the inventory year ahead. And I would hope that we could probably release, you know, a million to 1.5 million inventory over the next 12 months. Uh, is there any geographic preference in m a opportunities well i think um it's always good if they're on your doorstep <laughs> uh, you know ivs is obviously obviously quite near to us but you know we are we are an international business you know business with offices in the us and uh, new zealand and elsewhere so um i don't think there is i think if we found an ivs type business you know in germany for example uh, there'll be no reason why you wouldn't want to execute against that so i think overall the answer is probably no there isn't a geographic preference and some and G gerard o commented that the 10 million turnover for smart manufacturing in 2026 seems too low, uh, given your ambitions. Well, it, it is a goal, isn't it, Imo? And, uh, you know, clearly we're we're hoping to deploy cash for M&A purposes. And, uh, yeah, hopefully there will be a good, good opportunity to exceed that number in the future. Main competitors, do any of these have marketless technology? Um, our main competitors in Vicon is Optitrack, who are owned ultimately by the Chinese, uh, and Colossus, who are a Swedish business. In all cases, they partnered with other people on Markless to, the, to this point. Um, one might suspect everyone's working on it, because if, they, if they're not, that's probably a, a misstep. Um, but no sign, no signs of a of their own homegrown solution yet. And given the level of investment required to build the the Markless team that we've got at Vicon, um, and that was my third attempt to get the money. So um, it's it's it is a different set of disciplines, and you've got to be able to to uh, accept a number of years of of research before the the product comes out. And unfortunately, the Oxford Metrics board was supportive of that. Um, average time from clients showing an interest in your technology to an order being received, anything, uh, the record is 15 years to close an order. That was a long time ago with a hospital in the UK. Um, and we've closed deals in less than a month and everything in between. Um, it's the, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, Vicon market share, I'd say we're probably half of the market based tech stack. Um, margins from Markless and smart manufacturing clearly needs to uh, to fit the, the targets of the group. Um, I think we've covered most of them. Hopefully, hopefully the same and different from Nick's strategies. I've hope, hopefully answered that one. Uh, cash prudent to keep in hand after making acquisitions. Maybe we'll answer that one later. Anything else, David, do you want to cover? Yeah, I'm just going to, I didn't realize I was on mute. But on the uh, margins question, it's, there's two separate questions there, really. Smart manufacturing, if we if we look at IVS, they, they obviously look very much like Vicon. 
in terms of their business model, their gross margins, their deal sizes and so forth. But I think the real opportunity ultimately will be marketless. And, uh, you know, given that is a cloud based solution and the opportunity to, you know, charge customers on a subscription basis will mean there will be an underlying, you know, improvement in, uh, you know, gross margins at that level. It will all depend on the mix. And, the, and I think you may have already said, Imo, that obviously we wait to see exactly how that's going to bake out in the future. But hopefully it should be good news. Um, Great. I think... Uh, I think if I may jump in there, Imogen, David, for every question you seem to answer, there's another two or three that come at you. So I think just in the interest of time, we'll make any further questions available to you uh, post today's meeting. We can always add responses there if it's appropriate okay. to do so. Um, yeah. Imogen, David, I know investor feedback will be particularly important to you both, and I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their feedback. But I wonder before doing so, if I may, Imogen, just come back to you just for a couple of closing comments. And then, as I say, I'll redirect investors for their thoughts. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending today. I hope you found it interesting and we'd be certainly happy to, to answer any future questions. And just to also mention that there will be a Capital Markets Day for Oxford Metrics sometime in April of 2024. Thank you. That's great. Imogen, David, thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Oxymetric PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and wish you all a very pleasant morning. Thank you.